Hi, my name is Emily Dunford and I'm a PhD researcher in Theatre and Performance Studies at the University of Warwick. My work focuses on Coventry's tenure as UK City of Culture 2021. And I have a special interest in the ways that the scheme affects people's experiences of making cultural work and their perceptions of place. As I'm recording this video, the shortlist for the UK City of Culture 2025 has just been announced. Bradford, County Durham, Southampton and Wrexham County Borough. I imagine that people with a connection to those places are wondering what the scheme is all about. Hopefully this video can answer some of your questions. I'll explain what the UK City of Culture scheme is, how it's organised and what the year of culture that you experience might be trying to achieve. So the big question, what is the UK City of Culture? Well, it's a competition launched by the UK government's Department for Digital Culture, Media and Sport in 2009 which designates the title of UK City of Culture to a city, town or group of places outside of Greater London every four years. Coventry is the third UK City of Culture after Hull 2017 and Derry London Derry 2013. And now at this point, some of you will be thinking, but I remember Liverpool as capital of culture and wasn't Glasgow capital of culture? And you'd be right. Glasgow and Liverpool have both been European capital of culture. The European capital of culture was founded in 1985 and is awarded to multiple places in the EU each year. It was off the back of Glasgow's 1990 and Liverpool's 2008 10 years as European capital of culture that the UK City of Culture scheme was designed. As with the European capital of culture, the UK City of Culture focuses on cultural activity leading the development of a place, using culture to positively impact social factors, cultural participation, health, economics, the built environment and more within the host city. This is a popular approach to governance at the moment, but it's not a new idea. The UK City of Culture scheme sits in a long term context of UK policy efforts to increase access to the arts on a regional level use culture within strategies for the development of an area, and in the past 30, 40 or so years, devolve arts funding away from central government to private investment. To give you a very brief context for the UK City of Culture scheme, let's quickly whiz through the past century's policy expectations for cultural activity. I'll put some reading suggestions in the description so you can explore those for a bit more detail. The 19th century saw the popularisation of publicly available arts and engagement with particular kinds of cultural activity was presented as a path to self-improvement, as Eleonora Belfiore and Oliver Bennett note in their book, The Social Impact of the Arts. This understanding of the arts as in some way civilising gradually moved during the 20th century towards a recognition of cultural activity of having broader social impacts. Following the creation of the Council for the Encouragement of Music and the Arts, which subsequently evolved into the Arts Council of Great Britain, there was an increase in government investment in cultural activity. Olivia Turnbull gives a fantastic account of post-war to late 20th century arts funding in the book Bringing Down the House, The Crisis in Britain's Regional Theatres, and says that by the 1960s, Local authorities and metropolitan county councils increasingly demanded a clearer social emphasis as a way of measuring regional theatres' contributions to the welfare of the local community. The expectation that subsidised cultural provision would serve to support the state's social functions is similar to the contemporary justification of the UK City of Culture as a mechanism for supporting a range of social and economic city developments. By the late 1980s, Government funding for the arts had been significantly cut, with private sector investment in culture promoted to plug the funding gap. We might see the UK City of Culture scheme as sitting within a deep-seated philosophy held by generations of policymakers that engagement with culture has social benefits, and at the same time, as a continuation of the promotion of multiple sources of funding for cultural activity, including private investment. Now let's turn to the competition itself. How does the City of Culture competition operate and how does the winning location fund its year of culture? Following a bidding process, which includes long listing and short listing stages, an advisory panel will recommend a winner to the Secretary of State for DCMS, who will choose the next UK City of Culture. 
The competition criteria has changed during each iteration to prioritise different features of the scheme. Looking through the scoring criteria for the 2013, 17 and 21 competitions, for example, we might infer a greater prominence given to tourism, economic and partnership impact over time, because the points available for these criteria increase, while cultural and artistic strengths and learning and evaluation criteria decrease their number of overall points available. The process has changed too. For the 2025 competition, long-listed places were allocated £40,000 to develop their application more fully. Bidding locations may have put some of this money towards the development of a cultural strategy, which could focus the place's decisions over a long-term period, regardless of whether or not they win the City of Culture title. And how is the Year of Culture itself funded? DCMS supports the administration of the scheme, but you might be surprised to hear that there isn't a cash prize for the winning city. Instead, cities of culture are expected to fund the year through a patchwork of multiple sources of funding, for example, lottery funding, trusts and foundations such as the Heart of England Community Foundation, partnerships, private investment and directly from government sources. This funding may be allocated specifically for particular activities, for example, the Spirit of 2012 Fund awarded £200,000 to support Coventry City of Culture Trust with their community-facing Caring City initiative. With the UK City of Culture being a large strategic programme, major funders such as the Arts Council will be looking at how their strategic aims and those of the host city can intersect as well. So, what may we expect from the next UK City of Culture? The host city's delivery organisation will have a particular areas of focus, such as engaging with every ward, but not every part of a city of culture's activity will be organised directly by the delivery organisation. There's the top-down approach to the organisational structure, which you'll probably be familiar with, but we could also ask what would be possible if a grassroots approach was employed, or some sort of combination the year itself is likely to have a broad understanding of culture to include varied forms of cultural activity, such as everyday and community forms of participation, non-traditional performance spaces, such as community centres and streets, and multidisciplinary arts, in addition to, for example, performances in theatres and visual arts in galleries. Local artists and cultural workers might find that their roles and workloads shift throughout the City of Culture period between varying levels of ownership, budget and time for projects, in addition to providing expertise and guidance and working collaboratively within the cultural sector. I'd ask how those bidding for City of Culture 2025 plan to support and maintain their local cultural sector beyond the Year of Culture. In general, cities of culture are designed to be catalysts for socio-economic change, a focused attention, funding and energy for a discrete period in order to enable long-term development for the host city. Because of this, legacy planning is a crucial feature of the UK City of Culture programme and something likely to be in development prior to the year of culture beginning. So during a year of culture, you can expect activities aimed at a public audience, co-created and participatory work, and some things that might not be so visible, like the strengthening of the cultural sector's infrastructure. Finally, some key takeaway points on what you can expect from a UK city of culture. Number one, programmes of work funded through numerous sources and a short term spike in funding for cultural activity and city development in the host location. Number two, a focus on the social functions of cultural activity. How might engagement with cultural activity support a community's well-being or affect perceptions of the host city or encourage dialogue about a contested history. Number three, culture understood broadly to include a range of cultural pursuits which are likely to take place in a mixture of traditional and non-traditional venues. And number four, a significant interest in long-term legacies of the year of culture, linking into regional strategies, activities that slow burn over a long period of time, and monitoring and evaluation and academic research that tracks what's going on before, during and after the Year of Culture. I'll put some links in the description to sources of further information about the UK City of Culture scheme, but we'll have to wait until May 2022 to hear which city is awarded the title of UK City of Culture 2025. 
Thanks for listening.